May 2022, the Chancellery in Berlin. Narendra Modi is here with some of his most senior cabinet members for a day of intense consultations with their German counterparts. The result, a long list of agreements between the two sides on green development, secure communications, migration, and many more issues. A couple of years. The four powers hold regular naval exercises, as seen in this Indian Navy video. They're designed to make their forces work together and send signals to Beijing that crucial shipping lanes must remain free. But the Quad is not a military grouping, and India's government is cautious about talk that it's all about containing China. The Quad is not intended to be threatening to China, but the Quad is intended to message that democracies have shared interests that you cannot have with non-democracies. Uh, and so we are working together uh, to reassure and assure some of the fundamental principles of a democratic and open world, which is access to the sea lanes, uh, respect for sovereignty, uh, and all of that. But there are calls for the Quad to become something more. Well, we had never allowed it to develop a security component. Well, maybe we need to rethink that, because maybe we will need such a mechanism since the Chinese are breathing down our borders and they just killed our soldiers less than two years ago. So, for example, do I see a problem with introducing a military dimension into the Quad? If the others are willing, I wouldn't have minded one. Um, would I want to see more than just information sharing with some of the Western countries where there is indeed some cooperation, particularly in the counter-terrorism front already, intelligence sharing and so on? Would I be willing to see more than that in terms of uh, military cooperation? My answer is yes. Some have even talked about the Quad as the seed of an Asian NATO, a full-scale defensive alliance. But for India, that would be a break with its tradition of resisting alliances, a tradition deeply held across the political spectrum. Some people asked, is India's position one of strategic ambiguity? No, it is not. India is quite clear that we are not ambiguous. Uh, we, we will take steps primarily from national interest and in cooperation with other democracies. What the difference also means is this, that uh, alliances in the West uh, have had a mixed track record. In the Middle East, the US has had many, many alliances. Um, not all of them have fared very well. Would I want India to publicly declare itself an ally of a country? I'm not even sure I'm ready to bite that bullet because the word alliance implies to some degree a mortgaging of your freedom to make your own decisions. And we are a country that has been under 200 years of foreign rule, where a foreign country was making our security decisions and our geopolitical uh, postures for us. Having won our sovereignty just 75 years ago, for us, it's too precious to compromise and surrender. We want to be the ones deciding our own fate. Despite that, Lisa Curtis told us that the US would be up for an alliance with India if attitudes in Delhi were to change. Well, I think the answer is yes. In, uh, the U.S. would be very interested in having a very close partnership, uh, even an alliance, if it were possible. But it's frankly not possible. India is not interested. In so Western powers have some decisions to make about how much military tech they're willing to share with India. But this push for closer ties goes well beyond security. At the Ricina Dialogue in Delhi, the European Union's most powerful figure hailed a new deal for engagement on technology and trade. And she held out the prospect of a bigger goal yet, a free trade agreement. Therefore, I am very pleased that today Prime Minister Modi and I have agreed to establish an EU-India Trade and Technology Council to tackle key trade, economic and technological challenges. And now it's in uh, negotiating stages with Canada, with the United Kingdom, with a number of other partners and with the EU. We have a lot to learn from Europe and a lot to gain by strengthening this, this relationship. Not just again in terms of trade, but even in terms of regulations. 
for instance, the whole data protection laws. To a large extent, we are motivated. We are quite inspired by the changes and reforms that Europe is bringing in uh, because human rights are at the center of uh, a lot of uh, the reforms that are being brought in. And India, being a plural democracy, uh, a liberal democracy, I think those are our aspirations as well. So moving forward, there is only one way uh, we can really move, which is close up. You hear a lot about values underpinning these projects. That is, democracies, India and the West, are a natural fit. The question is, how close are they really? Delhi 2022. Properties owned by Muslims are demolished by local authorities. DW covers events on the scene. Bulldozer is a term trending in India right now as a troubling wave of anti-Muslim violence hits the country. Authorities gave orders for bulldozers to demolish many structures here. These businesses that stood behind me were largely owned by Muslims. And videos even show officials ripping into the outer entrance to a mosque. Officials say these demolition drives targeted illegal buildings. But many Muslims here feel there is a pattern of them being targeted. Over the weekend, a throng of Hindu men in a religious procession passed through this predominantly Muslim neighborhood. Communal riots broke out, leaving several injured. Similar clashes erupted in several states. The Bhartiya Janta Party, or BJP, is anywhere near to challenging the BJP on a national level. Modi is supreme. The BJP's critics say that its power is not just political, that it's backed up by massive business interests, a fusion of financial power and media influence. TV is a major source of news for hundreds of millions of Indians, and it's dominated by a small number of giant conglomerates that are friendly to the government. People are in the media not for the money they can make from the media, but basically for the influence peddling with the government that they can do. So you combine this model of large financial ownership. Uh, such large financial ownership almost always in India has business interests spread across the economy. Most of those business interests are far larger than the media interest. In some ways, the media is then seen as a trade-off of influence to help your other businesses grow. That is what is driving media in India today. So these large owners, many of them the equivalent of what you would call oligarchs in the case of Russia, own media. They have close links to the government. Some non-corporate media outlets do survive, including Hartosh Singh Bal's own caravan magazine, which has income from subscriptions. But like others, it faces an ongoing barrage of legal threats. All of us have, for various aspects of our reporting, faced police cases. There are sedition cases going on against our owners and my editor, you know, Joe. This is part of the game. Other organizations have similar sedition cases, cases for reporting what the government doesn't like. We have defamation cases going on against us by the son of the national security advisor, Ajit Dobal. So things like this are par for the course. But do they impinge our day-to-day -day ability to do what we need to do? At the moment, no. And I think that is primarily because the government does not see it as, as uh, real threats. We are pinpricks, and it can allow us to exist in some ways, even sell us as proofs of the fact that there is an independent media environment in this country. The outside world is taking note. In 2022, India slipped from 142nd to 150th place in the Press Freedom Index, produced by Reporters Without Borders. When the index began 20 years ago, it was ranked at number 80. It's questions over the commitment to pluralism and equal rights in the BJP's India that are causing most concern in the West. There is concern about the treatment of Muslim minority under the BJP government, particularly the second term, Modi's second term. We've seen some problematic developments with the um, Citizenship Amendment Act, which clearly um, discriminates against uh, Muslims. So I would just call Indian leaders back to their own, you know, founding documents and their own traditions of having, um, knowing that a strong democracy uh, is represented by the protections that it provides to its minorities. Jay Panda of the BJP insists his party is committed to exactly that. Let me make it very clear. India's constitution is going to be the final arbiter 
of every Indian's fate and India's constitution gives equal rights to every citizen. Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Sikh, Buddhist, everyone. And Western leaders are highly cautious about speaking out in public. At the Ricina Dialogue, Ursula von der Leyen was all praise for Indian democracy and made no mention of concerns of human rights. Germany's minister for the region did say concerns would be raised at the intergovernmental consultations, but he was very cautious too. I'm not here in India to teach and preach, but if our advice is needed and is welcome, Germany is willing to uh, help and to support. And after the consultations in Germany finished, there was no mention of human rights from either Olaf Scholz or Narendra Modi at their joint press appearance. And unusually for such an occasion, they took no questions at all at the Indian side's insistence. Even Joe Biden is reluctant to openly criticize Modi. When they met last year, he offered only a gentle hint of his views on events in India. And as the world celebrates Mahatma Gandhi's birthday next week, we're all reminded that his message of non-violence, respect, tolerance, matters today maybe more than it ever has. Of course, Western countries with so many failings of their own, many of them with histories of colonizing the global south, well, they have to think very carefully about criticizing a country like India. In a discussion looking back over 75 years since Indian independence, India's external affairs minister had a clear message for the West. We won't submit to your judgment. Look, we have to be confident about who we are. I, I, I think it's better to engage the world on the basis of who we are rather than try and please the world as a pay limitation of what they are. Uh, this idea that others define us, that, you know, somewhere there we need to get approval uh, of uh, other quarters, I think that's an era we need to put behind us. It's a message echoed by Jay Panda of Modi's BJP. The West needs to recognize that uh, a strong, uh, robust India and a secure India is not only in India's interest, not only in the West's interest, but also for the, uh, for the world, because this is the largest democracy that humankind has ever seen. Friends don't have to always agree with each other, but friends do have to have a core shared uh, agreement, which I think we are, you know, we are gradually getting there. We are certainly cooperating much more with uh, Western countries compared to just two decades ago. Karima Mohan of the German Marshall Fund think tank straddles the gap between India and Europe. She says Europeans wanting to nudge India in a more liberal direction are well advised to focus on civil society. Europe has a legacy problem with India because of uh, the experience of colonialism. I think um, countries have to be very mindful of what leverage they have to influence change in a third country. How, what can outside actors do? I think it is important to keep faith in domestic actors and what they're doing and asking how these actors in civil society or academia, intelligentsia, how they would like to be supported, if so. Um, so I think Europe has these conversations. Uh, many foundations, European foundations work in India. They work with a lot of groups in India. Um, and I think they're having those conversations. I think that is the best way to support, support this. As for India's beleaguered opposition, Shashi Tharoor rejects suggestions that Indian democracy itself is under imminent threat. Well, as an opposition member of parliament who's allowed to function freely and who criticizes the government day in and day out in the public space, I mean, I will still say more and more indications of autocracy. There have been a hollowing out of institutions of our state uh, which were formerly independent and whose independence was greatly prized, uh, which have become much more uh, overtly or covertly subordinate to the interests of the government of the ruling party. I think what we can say is, from, from having been a liberal democracy, we've become a much more illiberal one. From his vantage point working in independent media, Hathor Singh Bal has a darker view. India is coming to resemble Russia and China far more than it resembles Western democracies. That The illusion that it is necessarily in that camp, given what is happening here, is not borne out by the facts on the ground here necessarily. So the West will have to deal with this country 
through very hard nosed means rather than by thinking that this common shared value of constitutional democracy is going to pull India into our sphere. That is not true. The, the India has no such desire. This regime in India does not represent any desire to emulate the idea of constitutional democracy. It is trying to subvert. So for all the talk of India and the West coming together around shared values to push back against autocracies, is that really what's happening here? I think that is not the right framing for building a stronger relationship between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Because if we go with certain standards, then a lot of countries in the Indo-Pacific will not fit to those standards of uh, democracy and other issues that are being brought up. Um, so I think one has to recognize the diversity of political systems that exist in the Indo-Pacific. And therefore, I, I, I personally feel that this democracy versus authoritarian framing is not very useful because it will alienate more partners and it will win. The West would clearly like Delhi to sign up fully to the club of liberal democracies. But as we've seen, it's not a perfect fit for either side. But let's think back for a moment to where we started and India's geopolitical squeeze between a Russia going rogue and a mounting threat from China. While India faces some massive choices ahead, Western powers also have some hard thinking to do. And I get a strong sense that some honesty on their part would go down well here. When dealing with superpowers with no such qualms, there's no time to lose.